So our next speaker is William Ryerson. Bill Ryerson is the president and founder of Population Media Center. He's also president of the Population Institute, and he's board chair of Progressives for Immigration Reform. Bill has spent 39 years working worldwide in the fields of reproductive health and global sustainability. In 2006, he was awarded the, and I hope I say this, pr this correctly, the Nafis Kadik Prize for Courage from the Rotarian Action Group on Population and Development. Bill earned his BA from Amherst College and a master's in philosophy from Yale. He's here to discuss uh, how U.S. immigration policy impedes the economic de progress of developing nations, and uh, we're very grateful to have him. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Leah, for inviting me. Um, before I get into this topic of the impact on developing countries, I want to respond to something Steve posed as a question, which is, why is it that birth rates among at least some immigrants seem to go up when they move to this country? Uh, most of my work has been in the developing world, uh, particularly in Africa and Asia, so I can't speak knowledgeably about Latin American migrants to the U.S., but I'll give you one example. Africa's most populous country, Nigeria, with 134 million people, has a fertility rate of 5.7. What most people don't know is that the 2008 Demographic and Health Survey showed that the average married woman wants seven children, the average married man wants nine. So indeed, to achieve what they want, they need to increase the fertility rate. Now, why aren't they having more children? Number one reason is poverty. If they move to the United States, that poverty is alleviated, and they're able to increase their family size to the desired number. Now, for all of human history, it has been desirable to have very large family size. India was at zero population growth in 1925 with a six-plus child average family size because four of the six would die on the way to adulthood, and so it took having that many children in order to have to survive and to have the population replace themselves. It is really the result of a success story that we have a global population problem, the success story being the child vaccine programs and public health measures that were largely put in place at the end of World War II that brought infant and child death rates down dramatically around the world and caused the gap between the existing birth rates and the now much lower death rates. And indeed, birth rates have been trending down uh, in most developing countries because people are gradually finding out they don't have to have so many children in order to replace themselves. And they're also starting to wake up to the fact that indeed having six or ten children may not be the best old age security measure or, for that matter, uh, manageable in terms of, of the... Uh, lifestyle and economic welfare of the family that they're concerned about. Um, Rwanda, I think, is a case in point. Rwanda uh, is a population uh, that has a six-child fertility rate, uh, so every generation they're dividing the plots of land into three. Most of the people uh, are farmers, and so each generation uh, the size of the farms is divided by three, and uh, they are getting smaller and smaller to the point that now a majority of the population of Rwanda is malnourished. And therefore, Rwandese are colonizing eastern Congo, thus some of the fighting that's going on there. What is driving this poverty is indeed population growth. And one of the things that I launched into right after hearing Paul Ehrlich speak on the Yale campus when I was a graduate student in 1968 that got me interested in the environmental side of this issue, and indeed I was being trained as an ecologist, was to look at the work of a Princeton demographer named Ainsley Cole, who was looking at the economic impact of population and fertility issues. Uh, indeed, when you look at the situation in developing countries, High fertility rate in low-income countries leads people to spend all of their incomes on food, housing, 
clothing, basic survival needs for their family. When fertility rates drop without any change in family income, people can save a little bit of money. What happens to savings? It goes into capital formation. Capital formation allows businesses to borrow money and expand. That builds employment. And that builds employment in the face of decreasing numbers of people trying to enter, enter the labor force. That raises wages. On top of that, savings can be used to buy manufacturing goods, just thus stimulating the manufacture, manufactured goods, thus stimulating the manufacturing sector. Savings can be used for education, thus increasing e economic productivity. And savings can be used uh, by the government in the form of taxation of the growing economy to build infrastructure. In the average developing country, the per capita lifetime expenditure on public infrastructure, schools, roads, municipal offices, water, sewer, electricity, all the public infrastructure is $13,000 US per capita over the lifetime of each capita. It's not a whole lot of money. In this country, it's a whole lot more, probably 10 times that amount. But in the average developing country, $13,000 per capita uh, in infrastructure need at the current standard of infrastructure. Multiply that times net growth of the world's population of 82 million per year, a new Egypt every year, and the tab just to keep per capita infrastructure even in the developing world is a trillion dollar. And the developing countries' governments have nowhere near a trillion dollars to spend on infrastructure and on top of that, the places with the highest infrastructure expenditure are the cities. Rural to urban migration is adding on to the population growth of these countries to the point that you find cities like Kinshasa, which I visited in during the rainy season, which floods whenever it rains because it's an infrastructure designed to handle 600,000 people and 10 million people living there and thousands of people sleeping in the open because there just are not enough buildings, let alone schools to educate the growing numbers of people. So indeed, Population Media Center, you've heard one thing mentioned about our work in putting population and sustainability experts on talk radio in the U.S. to try to get this issue back in the consciousness of the American public. Uh, most of our work is in developing countries doing family planning soap operas long-running serialized melodramas in which characters gradually evolve into role models for the audience for daughter education, use of family planning, avoidance of AIDS, small family norms, allowing girls to go to school instead of marrying them off at age nine, as is currently happening in northern Nigeria, where our program has the top ratings of any show on the air, and allowing them to wait until adulthood to start childbearing, and spacing of children for better economic and health and welfare. So I see a lot of the developing world. I get to travel to places like Kinshasa and Addis Ababa. Uh, next week I'm going to Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea where we have a new program getting started. And one of the things I'm very much aware of in these countries is that in fact when you look at the role models for these countries, they are China, they are uh, Thailand, they are Sri Lanka. These are countries that are huge success stories. Thailand now has a fertility rate of 1.8. And it didn't do this by going through what is called the demographic transition of becoming a European standard of living and then having the fertility rate drop. They promoted family planning and small family norms in a massive way. There's a person there named Michai Viravadaya who deserves a great deal of credit for the use of all of the media to promote small family norms. And when the family size dropped, the economy took off. I am concerned about climate change, but at the same time, I think that it's a human right that people in places like Ethiopia need to increase their ecological footprint because many people there are starving and they need to be able to lead better, more dignified lives. And I see family planning and smaller family norms as a major route to achieve that goal. In Ethiopia, 
And unfortunately, in the United States and Europe as well, there is no unmet demand for reducing consumption. Uh, and indeed, one of the mo more interesting editorials I've read in the last year by a uh, former editor of the Portland, Oregon paper was entitled, Forget Shorter Showers. Because many people, as Chris Martinson will probably say and said in a meeting we had yesterday, if given a choice between growth or prosperity, would choose prosperity. They want to improve per capita lifestyles. That's what is important to people, not having the maximum number of people living at the lowest possible uh, standard of living uh, that is sustainable. Now, uh, one, one other quick aside, uh, Roy mentioned uh, journalists not finding anybody who would talk about population. There's also resistance from on high. Paul Ehrlich and I and Tim Wheeler from the Boston Sun, uh, uh, Baltimore Sun did a uh, panel at the Society of Environmental Journalists conference a year ago. And because Paul was there, it was standing room only. And Tim Wheeler spoke about his attempt to cover population as a component of environmental issues that he was reporting on. And his editor made, made him take, the, take that reference out. So indeed, there is felt pressure at a lot of different levels by, by journalists to comply with uh, the current norms. Speaking of norms, and now I'm going to get into the topic Leah assigned me. <laughs> How am I on time? I have three minutes left. Uh, oh, good. Um, I used to know J.R.D. Tata, India's leading industrialist, and I've met his nephew, Ratan Tata, who took over running Tata Sons Limited. Tata founded Air India, they produce the trucks and automobiles of India. He has uh, a soap company, a cement company, Tata Steel, his big operation. And J.R.D. Tata was very concerned about India's population problem. Now he used to give talks at college campuses around India and because of who he was, he could get away with something that I've often wished I could do. He would walk out on the stage and he would say, I am J.R.D. Tata. Are there any questions? <laughs> and then the hour would proceed <clears throat> with students asking him questions about his career and his entrepreneurial activities, etc., and he would respond. And he said to us uh, a few times, he was always shocked when he gave a talk on a college campus in India that none of the students seemed to be concerned about population. And he would always end his talk by saying, okay, thank you for all your questions. Why have none of you asked me about India's population problem? You know we're growing by a new Bombay every year. And he said, invariably, some student would say, sir, we're not concerned about India's population problem because when we get our degrees, we're planning to move to the United States. That's where our future is. 